Well, in New Zealand, we actually have a real history of progressiveness around gender diversity. But the unfortunate thing is we're now stagnating. So uh, year on year, the statistics aren't changing much in terms of women at high le levels of leadership and uh, participation in the economy. For example, only 5% of P CEOs and chairpersons in New Zealand are women. So a greater balance of gender diversity and any kind of diversity actually at the senior leadership levels of organisations has been proven to drive greater levels of innovation within a company and creativity, uh, greater levels of motivation within the company and uh, really importantly stronger financial performance. And more broadly in the world, greater participation of women in their communities and their countries, so uh, in instances where women are more equal in their countries and their communities, you see uh, greater democracies at play. You see uh, less instability, less conflict, and really healthier functioning environments. So what all that leads to, from my point of view, is a bit of a revelation about this topic. So beyond it being unfair and beyond the debate around equality for women in the world, which is obviously still paramount, is now you start to see that when women participate more fully in leadership roles, whether it be in their communities or their countries or businesses, you see greater success. And I should say now, what I'm not saying is that women should dominate in those roles and only women should lead, because the studies really back up the fact that uh, greater balance of diversity of any kind in leadership roles is what where the magic comes in in terms of success for companies. They all go through things like uh, high levels of innovation and creativity are driven through companies, much stronger financial performance through companies, greater team psychological safety, willingness to experiment, uh, team retention, and there, you know, there, there are many, many different ways this has been proven over and over again. I guess one of the most interesting things that I found when I was researching this topic was that analysts and shareholder agencies now are specifically looking for the gender uh, index within a company. So they're looking at the number of women on the board, they're looking at the number of women participating at the leadership team level, because that's so proven to uh, predict the financial success of the company. What we're really talking about though is not women for women's sake and not women to fill quotas and not women to make sure that it looks right on the balance sheet. What we're talking about is uh, qualified women who are uh, clearly right for the job being put in place so that there can be greater uh, diversity of perspectives brought to the table. There are many studies that have been done over the years uh, that look at the issue of bias in the workplace. And in fact, so many that people now talk about, you know, the um, admiration of the problem. So many of the studies stop short at just saying there's bias and there's a problem for women because bias exists. Um, what I think uh, is a better way to think about it is um, social scientists say bias really exists as young as the age of you know three. When we're all little, we understand and pick up from our families uh, who's the in-group and who's the out-group, and there's this, it begins. So anybody that says that they don't have bias is probably not telling the truth, because we all do. How this manifests itself for women in the workplace is that there are inbuilt gender stereotypes that a lot of people have about women. And when they're being interviewed for jobs or when they're going through performance evaluations, uh, people use bias, which is really a cognitive shortcut, a way to not to have to make so many decisions. How do I quickly make a snap decision about this? And they default to uh, things, you know, you, you hear it talked about all, of, all the time in the literature, like uh, the motherhood penalty. So she's a mother and they start to think through, but is she a good mother? Will she be, you know, will she be good to her children? Or on the flip side, uh, is she uh, committed to the job? Is she really gonna be able to deliver now that she's had children? And so those kind of biases come into play. Uh, there's the likability penalty. When women lead, it's uh, uncomfortable for many people because they were brought up to think that women should be behaving in a certain way and not necessarily uh, leading in the way that women lead. Uh, and so it's those biases that tend to trip up women along the way. But there are many companies that are doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, New Zealand Defence Force, New Zealand Police, a lot of the banks in New Zealand are looking at bias, whether it be conscious or unconscious, and trying to uh, really work through that and make sure that that's not an inhibitor for women in the workforce.
I think the most critical thing is, is that it's led by the top, so that the CEO of the organisation is informed, uh, educates people and is very clear about the business case for diversity within, within that organisation. I think the, uh, the error is to try and put that to the HR department and say it's an HR responsibility. So I think first of all CEO led uh, uh, direction on that. I then think a link to the business strategy is really important. So a lot of the companies that I've been talking to look at this as a competitive advantage and a potential competitive advantage. So yes, it's about equality. Yes, it's about fairness and inclusion. But actually, if they get it right, you can see the effects that it'll have on the business. I think first and foremost, I would uh, give advice to young women in business to really understand themselves and understand what's unique about themselves. So in the past, I think we all used to look to establish set models and ways of leading and compare ourselves to those and say, uh, could I do that? And if I can't see myself in that situation, then I can't be that person or I can't have that job. Whereas I think what's happening now is there are much more progressive role models uh, for leadership out in the world. And I think understanding, uh, you know, it sounds funny, but understanding your unique power, your superpower, and building around that and becoming your own leader is really important advice. I also think taking on big challenges is important. I think, um, you know, there's a, a famous statistic that men jump in when they're 60% ready and women wait until they're 100% ready. <laughs> and I think the men are right to do that. And I think, you know, a lot more young women that I see I talk to and say, jump in, take that challenge, you can actually do it now. And then there's two more things that I would uh, advocate for young women now. Resilience is as important as it ever was. I think um, Hillary Clinton describes it as, you know, taking criticism seriously because you might learn something, but never taking it personally because it will get personal. And I think delineating between the two is really important and listening and making sure that you're resilient enough to, to listen to that criticism and process it in the right way. And the other thing we spend a lot of time talking about is confidence. And this is a, this is a real problem for a lot of young women coming up uh, in any industry uh, because uh, they fundamentally can be doing an incredible job, they can be uh, nailing all aspects of the job, but you see it time and time again on performance reviews where people end up saying, I just wish she'd be a bit more confident. And the problem with that is that can actually sound like another criticism for them. I think it's if you do these things that I'm talking about, of finding who you really are and what you could uniquely bring to the table rather than comparing yourself to others and uh, working really hard and being resilient, then I think you can overcome some of those confidence issues uh, that I'm talking about.